Hi, I'm Michael Killen. The United States has just released its latest assessment of the impact of climate change on the United States, on various parts of the United States, on various industries and sectors of the United States. The study is somewhat earth-shaking. I have invited Rapu Malahatra. He is a former SRI fellow. He's the author of this wonderful book that I always refer to, A Cubic Mile of Oil. It helps us think clearly about energy issues. I've invited Rapu to answer a few questions about this new report. Rapu. Michael, pleasure. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so let me just ask, the report was mandated by Congress. Yes. Okay, and this is something not controlled by the President of the United States. Would that be correct? That is correct, and it has started long time ago, since the 90s. Right, and he, no doubt, never read it, okay? I mean, we, we he do says it. He says he glanced at it. Yeah. <laughs> and there was something like 15 agencies of the United States government, you know, the real brainy groups, maybe that, that put it together. Maybe you'd name one or two of them. So there are people from Department of Energy, Department of Defense, Department of Agriculture, Department of uh, uh, Commerce, Transportation, then the NIH, NSF, uh, gosh, I may be missing a few here and there. There's also the U.S. In a international aid, you know, development. Sure. and sure. So all kinds, because these are the people who, who, this climate change intersects all these agencies. It's not just one person, it's the other. Sure. So that's why it's, to get down to the impact, what it means for individuals okay. in different places. We'll come to that. So 15 Around organizations, that. something yeah. like that, Yeah. organizations of the United States government put this report together, and these organizations have no hidden agenda except to help the people of the United States. Would, would, would that be correct? Uh, that is the, yes, that is the stated goal. They are there to provide us to be able to make some informed decisions. And that's the sole purpose for this report. When you looked at it, what were some of the key findings, or one or two of them, that you found especially interesting? Okay, so, the. Let me just uh, add one other thing to the report. This report came on the heels of another report by the IPCC, which is the international, the UN body's climate change report. And they also periodically come up with assessments. They deal with what the impacts of climate are globally or something and where we are, but they give us lots and lots of numbers. And globally. Globally. And but they, they talk about the, what the impacts are at that level, kind of, and, and where we are in terms of greenhouse gas emissions of different types and where they are um, and how it's impacting. And they are, they are actually looking at the global models and trying to see how bad the situation is. It's going to be bad or worse or even worse than that. There, there's no good news in here. So that was the one, and this one comes on the heels of that, the U.S. report, which builds on it. It really... Uh, lays out those numbers in a very nice, concise way together. And then, as you uh, said, they really go into looking at what are the impacts for the people. Can I interrupt you? You were talking about the IPCC study. What was the one final statement they made in that study that might be... We are way too late. We are way too late. We are not going to. We are not going to meet our goals that we have, have set out to. The chances of that are really getting dim. And now, so 1.5 degrees is history. If we want to stop it at two, it's going to be hard. Maybe it'll be th uh, three degrees C, or. But any of those scenarios really then mean much more damage and much more hardship for everybody, okay. particularly those who can least afford it. Yes, and, and those are a lot of people in the red states. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about also well, globally. The, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, yes. yes, of course, that's a global thing. Okay, so the IPC study just came out recently, and 
they had some dire assessments yes. uh, trying to encourage the world you know we better do something if we all and our children grandchildren want to have yeah. at least a, a nice mm -hmm. life what we tended to have can we go back now to the United States' own yeah. study? Yeah. Uh, one of, you started to put into perspective that study and its impacts. So the impacts, they have done a lot on the economy. This was one of the things that stands out for this report is how much the economic impact or life impact, human health impact is in different places. And those numbers are really astounding. For the U.S., if the current trajectories were to continue, we are looking at 10% of the GDP which uh, by, by the end of the century, which would translate to robbing our economy of $2 trillion each year. I've got to think about that for a second. $2 trillion pulled out of the economy. And, you know, there is such, so much discussion today about finding jobs for people, yeah. especially yes. in, in the southern states and and, and so you're telling me, or this study is telling us, that the business opportunities, the job opportunities, as a result of the impact of climate change, are going to go basic like that. Or, the, you know, if we normally would have growth like that, we're now going to have, and it's not going to be good for the people who yeah. need to work. Right. Is that? It's not, it, that's right. It's not going to be good. And it's going to cost a lot. But as you can see, what's happening in France also... <laughs> You know, they're not looking at the end of the world. They're looking at the end of the month. That's the line, famous line that's been repeat, repeated many times. Is the Yellow West uh, marches that you have heard of these oh, people, yeah. right? The protesters yeah. uh, raising. And, and I, I heard that uh, the French uh, President Macron has uh, taken away, uh, taken back his uh, uh, proposal to raise taxes on uh, fuels in a way to... He, he had Mollify. proposed it as a way to... Uh, suppress greenhouse gases, but people say, well, that's a far off thing. I can't even meet my end of the month bills, so you are raising cost on me today. Yes. Well, so it gets really hard. That's part of the thing that we're talking about. It's, it's very hard to do because we need the energy. Yes. So I just want to go back to something you told me some other time, but France can afford to lower the price of oil because they already have one of the lowest rates of emitting carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere because they are a world leader of taking advantage of nuclear energy which is a clean you know they're not putting any it's not putting any more emissions up to speak of right uh, yes and no they were but the, but the, the What's really mind-boggling for me is that even France is now has, has made an objective to cut their nuclear power down to 50% of where they are, which to me as an environmentalist makes no sense. Yeah, um, because when you take away a source of energy, you have to replace it with something. Yeah. And what are they going to replace it with? Yes. So you say it makes no sense, but it obviously apparently makes sense to somebody. Yes. And do you have any, you want to speculate how it makes sense to them? Will we do that another show we, sometime? Well, I think we could, that could be a, a much bigger talk. But essentially, there are, it'll, uh, you know, there is very deep-rooted opposition to nuclear power globally. G you know, after Fukushima, Germany, you know, Japan closed down. I can understand that immediately. That was local. They did it temporarily. And they have st started to reopen the nuclear power plants. But Germany decided to start cutting out their nuclear power also. And Germany yeah. was on a, on a good track of reducing its greenhouse gas emissions up until... Fukushima. Up until Fukushima. And now I was with uh, executives from Japan mm -hmm. this week. And I asked them, and these are people who are in the know about these kind of things, how many people were killed from an explosion of Fukushima. And they said there was no explosion. There was no zero. zero people zero. have been killed. People have been harmed from the water. Would that be correct? And maybe something else. Uh, yes. So the, let me give you the numbers kind of here a little bit. 
15,000 or to, to, or to 15 to 20,000 people died from the tsunami. That was the immediate impact. Okay, uh, radiation killed nobody, zero. But then, because there were some explosions and all, and some radioactive spills were there, and the local radioactivity was high, then they had to clean up. And to do that, and the fears that were there, they were, they set goals for clean up such stringent, and they evacuated such a large area, and then the stigma of the of having lived through or coming back to it is so great that that may, mental anxiety has caused more than 1,500 deaths already. So the mental anguish about it has caused more deaths, 1,500 deaths. Radiation has caused zero deaths. Okay, so. Um, you know, we're really talking about this threat of climate change. Yeah. And I think anybody who's got a high school education today and can think critically can put two and two together and recognize we're yeah. heading toward yeah. a disaster. We need to do something about it. Why is it so difficult? Why is it so difficult for the people of the United States, let's say, to really get behind climate action? Yeah, so that's a very good, very good, good question. <laughs> that is something that I have thought about quite a bit also, and it, uh, and I think that uh, uh, first of all, we have to recognize that energy is absolutely essential. It's the yes. one thing that we all need. Can you imagine without? I mean, this set that we are walking on uses so much electricity, so much power. How did you get here? You probably drove your car. I drove my car. Yes. Uh, all this takes energy. Life on Earth takes energy. And if you're saying keep them underground, all the fuels, I'll say, well, give me something else. Give me an alternative. And, so, and then you look at the alternatives that they're being offered, the alternative solutions, solar or wind or something, and you see that they are so meager. They, you can't run industries on them. They are fickle. They, and to get them to the scale is going to be a, such a long haul. If I'm going to replace, I have to replace it at the, at the same rate. If I'm going to take this something off, I have to give them, otherwise your standard of living and, and immediate l hardship, which also causes infant mortality, lack of other uh, nutrition. Energy is at the basis for all these things. So they all get affected. It's very hard. So and I think uh, to answer your question about the why is it so hard for people to get behind it, the so-called deniers of what you know, the people you generally lump them, I think it, a, a lot of it comes from a reaction to the realization that our solutions that are being offered are making such little impact. Okay. That it, I, so a mental, you know, a cognitive dissonance then makes you say, I don't believe it, that it's going to happen. I think that's yeah. a reaction uh, that, that may happen. Yes, uh, we don't have much time left, but I, I want to say, I, again, I was with some Japanese executives this week, and we were talking about some of the issues you're talking about. And one of the men said, you know, nuclear goes with the electric car. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, do you tell us why? Here we are, we want to, you know, just without the trans, you know, looking at the transport sector, which is the one that uses oil the most, and we want to convert that to electricity also. We're using cubic mile of oil worth, right, just for transportation. So I need at least a cubic mile oil worth of electricity to put, substitute that transportation sector. Yeah. Where am I going to get that? After 500 billion euros, what did uh, Germany get? maybe about 10 gigawatts of capacity that produces barely 17% uh, of their electricity. Had they put that money into nuclear, there yeah. would be 100% and maybe even more to replace the transportation sector. All right. So I'm going to cut you off now, but I'm going to say uh, a, re a reason nuclear goes with the electric car is because, you know, when the sun goes down, energy slows down and the cars get charged at night and we also drive them but the nuclear runs 24, 24 hours a day yeah uh, 
This is a lovely book, A Cubic Mile of Oil, and your blog is also wonderful. And by the way, this is episode one of a new venture we have, and that is besides releasing this to the internet and uh, television stations where releasing this show is a podcast also to the internet. Rapu, Mike. I want to say again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael, for having me. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, my guest has been the chemist, the energy expert, Rapu Malahatra, the author of A Cubic Mile of Oil. And my next show is going to be with a professional chemist who's worked on many important projects at the great uh, research organization, SRI <laughs> International. And in talking to him, I discovered that this chemist, who's also a photographer, has studied shapes, lines, and patterns and their impact on us. And I have decided to invite Bob Ruick to come on this program and help us learn from what you discovered about the impact of shapes, patterns, and lines on people. Bob, thank you. Well, you're welcome. I'm glad to be here. Bob. Can you tell me one, two, or three of the most important projects you worked on at SRI? One of them was um, in the remediation of oil spills, oil spill cleanup technology. SRI was the primary research um, uh, agency for EPA after the Exxon Valdez spill. Mm. And we looked at um, dispersant effectiveness on a variety of oil spills, how long it had been on the ocean, how it had aged, and we found there was tremendous lack of energy. So we, st we were the prime research company in the world, actually, on that subject. Do you, do, am I correct? You said there was a lack of energy. Does that mean lack of interest? In no, not a lack of interest, a lack of knowledge. Is what, oh. what does an oil spill dispersant actually do when it's applied to an oil spill? And okay. people didn't understand that. So SRI and you work to help the public probably discover what is the best way to deal with an oil spill, the best person. solution. That was it. Right. That's important work. Can, was there, did you work on anything else important? <laughs> <laughs> um, another interesting one was to discover key properties of nerve gas agents that hadn't been published before. <clears throat> where the government wanted to clean up a, a nerve gas attack and there were certain key fundamentals that had not been studied up to that point, which I was very surprised. So we transported up Highway 101 with a police guard, <clears throat> enough nerve gas agent to, to, wipe, out all to of wipe, out all, wipe out all of Menlo Park. <laughs> Good, I'm glad there was no... And we were successful at determining those properties. Interesting project. You got a third one, and then I want to get to some contemporary things. A uh, third one might have been um, in um, <clears throat> designing anti-counterfeit tagants for U.S. currency. Oh, that is every legitimate U.S. bill has something a marker on it. A marker on it that the uh, mafia could not discern quickly enough, and so the tagants that we developed passed the test. They fuddled. $10 million of $10 bills through a detector, and our tagant was successful. Wonderful. So now, thank you. Now um, I'd like to ask you about, uh, you're also a photographer. Yes. And you somehow or another got the idea that you would study or observe what you have learned making photography with lines, shapes, and patterns, and you have then decided to share what you have learned with artists, and including phot photographers, so that they could find a way to make what they make, their, their art, right. have a greater impact on viewers. Am I correct? Yes. This is a very old subject. Painters have known this for years, going back to da Vinci and Michelangelo. They knew far more about the aesthetics of a good photograph than today's photographers. 
Um, I'm interested not only in the scientific aspects of photography, but in the aesthetics part. What turns you, what, what your mind creates when you see a certain shape and pattern and form? I'm certainly not the first to write about this subject. There are numerous articles on, on the internet, but I brought it more in line <clears throat> with what a photographer might want to learn about it in a book I wrote called The um, Impact or a feeling seeing reference guide to photography based on images, so lines, shapes, and patterns. Turns out there's a lot of psychological information published on that subject. Okay, now you're not limiting the, the benefit of what you've done to photographers, but you know, I'm an artist, a painter. Right. Like, like that one behind us. Right. So uh, I'm not gonna ask you if what you've made helps it has already helped me. And later on, maybe we'll get to it. Why don't we bring up one of your images and uh, maybe, you. maybe uh, we could take, uh, okay. Now, okay. what do we have here? Okay, uh, I, it's, some, it's a um, juxtaposition of several buildings, shapes and patterns in San Francisco. And so what I propose is that each one of those lines and patterns and shapes, and I'll go over that in a second, evokes an emotional feeling that we don't understand. I believe artists understand it better than photographers. For example, for example, there are, there are diagonals in that picture. A diagonal is a very dramatic energy um, type of line. There are, there are verticals which, which imply strength, stability and power and there are horizontal lines that imply peacefulness and calmness and we so i've been i use architecture as a seeing guide for a photographer to what to incorporate into their pictures to give a sense of a sense of of a psychological awareness i'd like to share what makes me a little uncomfortable on the left on a diagonal you have these frames and it's like you can see the sky, but the diagonal or the angle it's on makes me feel a little queasy. Is that? The angle? The diagonal's coming down that way on yes, the left. Yes, on the left. Is that, is that what you would expect me to say, that that image on the left causes me a little uh, uncomfortableness, no? Well, I'm a little surprised at that because um, a rectangle or a square is a feeling of security okay. and um, peacefulness. Maybe okay. it's the lighting pattern that bothers you. One side is strongly lit and the other one isn't. Could be. This and is a complex picture, I yeah. have to admit. Okay. Yeah, and maybe I don't see the rectangle. <laughs> okay. Okay. Could we see, have another one, please? Okay, what do we have here? Okay. And Here's a very abstract image of a building on Market or Mission Street in San Francisco. And it's a combination of diagonals and verticals. And if you stand right in the middle of that picture, you can see these <clears throat> following off of the main subject, which is the vertical. But I thought it was a uh, very um, abstract picture that gave me some sense of inner feeling. And now feelings, of course, differ from everybody. Yeah. So we don't always see the same things. This one makes you feel good? Yeah, oh, I, yeah, I love right. that one. All right, could we see one more? Okay, here, here are the Oracle buildings <clears throat> off of, I think, in Belmont, al alongside Highway 101. And I was particularly um, impressed with the curves, curves imply movement on the right-hand side yeah. of the picture. Again, there are diagonals, there are rectangles, and there are um, some verticals. What there, though, appeals to my emotions, hits my emotions. Uh, curves don't seem to bother me. Okay. I, yeah, motion, but motion doesn't necessarily bother me. Where's my emotions being hit by what you have there? I feel everything funneling into the middle of that picture. <clears throat> you know, all these patterns and shapes on the left hand and the right hand side uh, <clears throat> merge into the middle of the picture. And I wonder how, that, how that's possible. 
Here's curves on the right, diagonal, I mean, um, squares and rectangles on the left, and it's merging into something entirely different pattern. And so it gives me a feeling of what's going on. You know, I'd uh -huh. like to see more. Is what going on a good feeling or a bad feeling? Well, for you? it's a good feeling. It's a good feeling. Okay, now I learned from you, and I'm working on what's known as the Stanford painting. Right. It's a 15 foot by 6 foot painting. I have done something in it. Can I see the next one as a result of you? Now. Is this the same as this one? No. Okay. No, it's different. No, it's, it's different. Now, if you look more to the right, you, you basically see two buildings and you see two lines going around, black and white. Actually, the most important part is in the center where the black line goes up like this, Bob, and goes down and the white goes up. You see where they, sort of an undulation or a, okay? Well, anyway, as a result of you telling me an image like this that goes up like that and comes down is something that might bring attention yeah. and maybe even make somebody a little queasy. I don't know. Well, zigzag lines or undulating lines, which are the same thing in my opinion, create excitement. It has good points and it has bad points, just like our lives. Somehow we, we live from day to day, one day may be better than the next, and so the fact that you use undulating lines is a very powerful emotional feeling. And I did that, again, as a result of what you taught me, right where the most important action basically occurs in that painting. Now, I haven't finished that painting yet, but yeah. that's where heat is going to be removed from ice water and yes. some thermodynamics mm -hmm. is going to happen. And that should be in the center of the picture, by the way, which you, ha which pretty, you have. Yeah. Yeah. And so I am very pleased. Now, we haven't had much time, but if people go to Amazon, they could get your book, and, and your book does not necessarily focus so much on the complex images we presented, but, you know, hat, patterns, and I think it's really worthwhile. Would you say the name of your book again? It's a, ceiling, a seeing, feeling reference guide for photographers, which okay. is not been directed. Thank you.